This episode of the LabVIEW Experiment is brought to you live from GDevCon NA. Thank you very much, Taylor. Uh, so before we uh, kick started with the LabVIEW Experiment Live, this is fantastic, I'm appreciated. I actually want to highlight our Giants of Feelers actually as Taylor. Um, uh, uh, many projects in my house have been completed personally by listening to the LabVIEW Experiment, and Taylor's been a big part of helping this be executed in a variety of different ways. You can see maybe she's a degree in dance performance and performed professionally, taught and traveled with renowned dance companies, started working with Sam in 2021, full-time GDevCon organizer. That's like the global or it's here? or it's just this one, okay. Right, producer, editor, marketer, and she's coming out of retirement to do a professional theater choreography in San Diego. So a very diverse lady, and I've always appreciated the, the, the humor and the candor that you brought to accompany the technical end of everything. So thank you very much, Taylor. So. Um, so, my name's Norm, I work at NI, I've been a part of the LabVIEW community since 99, so coming on 25 years like Darren. Not always at NI, but uh, this is a big discussion about open source, kind of the uh, risk, what was, uh, what, uh, the, yeah, the risk or reward of talking about open source. Uh, but really, uh, the panel that we've got up here uh, have a real diverse and deep background in a variety of different ways with open source. I'm going to say one thing and then let them introduce themselves as well. Uh, we have the original OG, Open G uh, man himself here, Jim Kring, uh, kind of the father almost to some degree of open source within LabVIEW, right? Uh, we've got, and then, well, you know what, that's, let's go there. That's why I put that up there. Fantastic. Uh, we've got uh, Casey May, uh, uh, founder of Zaya. Solutions as well, Variety Toolkits, uh, uh, Jorg Hampel uh, of Hampelsoft Engineering, Derek Bomarito, if you ever see Illuminated G, that's his icon on the upper right, and then also Laura Mir Miller, who was up here uh, championing a variety of open source initiatives yesterday with Open uh, Open BCI. But you can see, if you've seen any uh, icon with the green background, that's Open G, like massive amounts of open source for Hampelsoft, Zaya, multiple projects, 106 repositories from, from Derek. But uh, before we really get in here, I think that idea of this risk or reward, thoughts on open source, for all of you to introduce yourself and then give this one definition of, what is your definition of open source? So Jim, how about you go, oh, sorry, yeah, Laura, ladies first, please. Hey everyone, yeah, uh, you met me yesterday. My name is Laura Miller. I'm on the GDEFCON board, um, working as an electrical engineering consultant in the Pittsburgh area right now. And um, yeah, so, do we answer the question too? <laughs> yep. What's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah so please. as far as like open source projects, like I mentioned, I'm really into the open BCI, open source hardware and software right now. Um, I would consider myself a maker and I've been a maker for a very long time. And it's exciting to finally get to combine my love of LabVIEW with my love of making things at home. For the longest time, a lot of the projects that I've worked on, I just can't do them in LabVIEW. I mean, I've been into Arduino and Raspberry Pi, um, Python, MicroPython, but a lot of really cool projects out there. And so finally, there's this intersection where I can use some of the VIs that like Derek has worked on and do something at home in LabVIEW. So it's really exciting. And I'm Derek, currently uh, one of the lead software architects uh, on the ground software team at Blue Origin. Um, so yeah, I do a bunch of open source development, uh, mainly for practice. Uh, every once in a while, somebody uses it, and that's awesome. Uh, get feedback. I think we're probably going to talking about some of those questions. Uh, as far as what open source means to me, I'm just gonna do a verbal word cloud, uh, standardization, <laughs> sharing, learning, um, and I think I'll leave it at those three for now. Hi, my name is Jörg. I am an Austrian living in Germany. I run a small consulting company. And for me, open source has always been a business asset. Uh, and then also I like to talk to people, with people, in front of people. I like to do stuff together with people. I like having my own team. I like integrating with our customers. And using open source and also inner source, open source in the context of like closed uh, organizational limits, I find that very interesting and very rewarding. And open source for us is also, like I said, a business asset uh, for us and our customers to work together more easily. I'm Casey. Um, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. As I mentioned, I'm a founder and partner of Zaya Solutions. Um, we do a lot of work with Actor Framework, so I'm a member of the Actor Framework Guild, which um, there's some open source projects associated with that. Um, I'm also a member of the GID Exchange Committee, which also part of the vision there is to improve the, the LabVIEW developer community through 
open source projects and contributions um, in, that, in that sense. Um, as far as what open source means to me, a, a lot of it is um, kind of security and the fact that the product, the tool that you're using can evolve and it's not tied to a single person or a single company, that, you all, that you're going to have access to it. So um, if, you, if somebody, the developer, main developer, wins the lottery, not, not the bus, right, um, <laughs> and goes off somewhere, then, then you, you can still, if there's a bug, you can fix it. Um, and also, I just like, I, when I'm working on open source stuff, I'm, I get a lot of self-doubt. I'm like, I'm not sure that this is the best way to do it or I don't like it. So having like, people to collaborate with, I enjoy that, finding uh, better ways to do things. Hi, everybody. Um, little known fact, I designed the abstract class glyph that's in the project, the little one that looks like a, a hollow box, yeah. and I did that using Microsoft Paint. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm dating myself. Um, so open source means a lot of things. What kind of sticks out for me is uh, kind of this positivity optimism. Uh, there's working together, there's openness, transparency, and also too, I, I really find that the open source communities that are successful and grow have really been uh, pioneers in creating spaces that are respectful for other people. The ones that succeed are ones that have uh, you know, a code of conduct that requires that we be respectful of other people and allow others to be uh, included and really, you know, values uh, the just innate intelligence of, of everybody and ideas and working together and how can we harness that. And I really think too, open source for me also, I think it, it, it really is an important part of the future ahead. Um, when we talk about AI, how does AI work? What's it doing? Um, I, I think it really requires a lot of great open source tools, transparency, uh, and working together. Thanks. And it's a very human activity. So. Thank you. Well, yeah, go ahead and keep that for now. Let's, I was hoping to lean into this a little bit more. We've got the, a moment to do so. One thing I didn't hear out of any of your mouths was free. Now, for me, as you know, I'm not a massive open source contributor with 107 packages on GitHub like Derek over there. You know, I was at the beginning of the OpenG Commander uh, a long time ago in 2003, uh, although I didn't work much on it. But the idea of what I think open source, my natural gravitation is, oh, this is free stuff. Um, is that why it was the? Can you anybody speak to like why did you not think of why was it not referenced at all in terms of the idea of it, Derek's? Give me, give me. Everyone's free to help us. <laughs> <laughs> There's always time involved in integrating, testing, making fixes, making it fit your use case. So free is part of it, but it's not really free. Okay. I will add to that that it's very difficult to sell to LabVIEW developers. So <laughs> to sell tools to you crowd is difficult. I think everybody <laughs> knows that. So the next best thing, I think, is to make it free and, and like bring you in into our, into our area of reach is the next best thing to me. So does open source always mean, uh, another thing that didn't happen in terms of the conversation is uh, closed IP. Is it, can you have open source and closed IP and how does that fit into this y'all's definition uh, of op open source? Yeah, I think it's all about finding ways to pay the bills. Like we all work in, you know, a capitalist mm -hmm. economy. When we go to the grocery store, we've got to get stuff. Can they so coexist, though? I think they can. So I think, um, in general, it's all about, you know, deciding, you know, is it better to just open something up because it's a wheel that a lot of other people have invented, or there's value in having the transparency and openness and having more eyeballs on it and or you know, just having other people being able to, to more thoroughly vet it. And then if pieces are, contain real trade secret IP, then keep those closed. Okay, awesome, thank you. All right, all right, next up. Well, how about, what is your experience with having others collaborate with you on your projects, right? Because a lot of you are owners, the originators of a lot of these, these open source concepts. Once again, OpenG has been around there for a long time. It's not Jim and everybody helped Jim. There's a lot of people on OpenG, right? You could probably come up with 
40 discrete people off the top of your head. Um, but in terms of when people, uh, like for Derek, for you, or for Jorg, when you do like the, uh, it, was it, what'd you say, oh, in-source, outsource, what was it again? In-source, right? Um, when you have other people step into that world, right? Because that's, uh, yeah, so what, what has been your experience? Good, bad, crazy, painful? Uh, my packages don't get used that often, but there, <laughs> there of course, are issues. People, uh, the most contribution I've gotten is people submitting issues to the GitHub repository, finding bugs, helping out. Um, and I think that's one of the, the big benefits is um, they're finding the things in the use cases that I didn't think of ahead of time. So it's just helping make it more robust than when I go to use it at work or use it for other projects. It's that much better because of it. Um, so in the contributions that I've gotten, they've all been positive. Yeah, I've had a, I guess, a pretty wide experience with, with collaborating with other people on open source. Some of the stuff that we've developed, um, a lot of it, or some of it is I've worked on pretty much, even though it's open source, it's been mainly me kind of doing the development. But there are other things like, like Bowser, the browser, which I talked about a couple years ago, which um, I, I talked with some of the people on the AF Guild, and we had some Zoom meetings, and they were able to, to contribute. And they're like, I don't know that I can contribute code to this, but just getting their ideas and uh, feeding in some of those features definitely helped grow the product. There's still more stuff I know we want to do, but it was a very positive experience in, in getting people's buy-in and feedback. And actually, it gives you a sense that like what you're developing, people might actually find useful, right? Versus what you think that they're actually going to use it for. So in that sense, it was yeah, l largely positive experience. Uh, we had contributions on three levels, I would say. Firstly, we use it internally. So we're now a team of eight. And uh, the open source workflows and processes and mechanisms and tools are one way to, to collaborate. So we can do that internally. And then the inner source scenario is where we use all those open, to open source workflows and tools and processes to collaborate with our customers, but still in a closed scenario. So the customers would be contributors, which is, I mean, we teach them how to do that and we work together. So that also goes very well, obviously. And then the third level would be just like the regular old open source thing. And there's a, I don't know, a handful of people using some of our reuse code. Uh, I'm going to talk about the generic networking tomorrow, for example. And we did have contributions, like actual code contributions, and actually done through the proper mechanisms, like um, cloning, forking, uh, merge requests. Um, so the experience is like very positive, I want to say. Uh, so one of the things that came up yesterday, and uh, uh, Laura was a, a, a great sport to, to humor me in terms of uh, coming up today. She was kind of a, a last-minute addition. But when she, when she mentioned the open hardware aspect of it, now I know that, that the, the open hardware wasn't something that you know, they weren't your board designs or anything like that. Uh, you know, but I, I, I've only seen the idea of open source hardware. And so like in terms of like, have you seen, uh, just having been associated with, uh, like, what does it mean to even have the open source hardware aspect of it associated with your open source software, which, which I think we can all understand the idea of that aspect of it. But have you seen anything like evolve or change in the open source hardware aspect of it as well? Uh, yeah, definitely. Like, like I mentioned, uh, I've been making things for a long time, and a lot of you have played with Arduino. That's huge. Raspberry Pi is huge. Uh, you basically enable people to develop things on their own that maybe, and even you know, across the world, basically. Um, and you're sharing things across the world um, with colleges and universities. And a lot of universities don't have the money to invest in this expensive equipment. So the open source hardware, um, yeah, I think it's paradigm changing, really. Um, and yeah, with OpenBCI, it's great, too. I mean, there's some downsides to open, side, open sourcing your hardware, just like with software. Um, you'll end up with knockoffs of your circuit boards all over the world. But um, I think it's, it's still a good thing. Um, and you can develop as you go, so. Nice, thank you. All right, so uh, the, kind of leading in that, it's a bit of a, of, a, of, a, of a merging, this idea of what value have you experienced from others' contribution? So it sounds like a lot of the things that y'all have put out there, basically that idea of uh, 
you've been putting things just on like GitHub, right? It's mostly GitHub, but you've got like GitLab's versions of it. Uh, but when people do submit, do you find that you're actually like, oh, I hadn't thought of doing that? Or has it just been so unidirectional, like you were mentioning, Derek, that being involved in putting stuff out there hasn't fed a lot back in? Or you're, where you're saying customers are in there, are you seeing like, wow, that's a that's massive amount of insights that I wouldn't have gotten on it. Like how would you rank the value of the incoming things in these open source projects? Uh, can you clarify the incoming things? Because like the sure. issues being submitted to me, I count that as incoming. But <laughs> well, that's one dimension, right? I, I, like bugs that you wouldn't have realized, and that can always clearly improve, like just base level quality. But I think there's the essence of what open source is supposed to be: is multiple contributors, not just a dumping ground for your cool stuff. Which indeed, a lot of us have cool stuff, and you've done a big guilty. Part of it. Yeah, exactly. But <laughs> at the same time, I think if we're all LabVIEW programmers, we're all trying to get closer to actually working in this open source mentality, or is it a collaborative, it's not even just open source, right? The open source is just one thing, it's just putting a shared drive on the internet effectively, right? There's not a lot. But it's really, I think it meets the vision of being inclusive when there's collaborators on it. So for those things that we have had come in, uh, what kind of things maybe have surprised you or you've seen a lot of value from uh, in that aspect? Well, I was gonna say one of the, the very, one of the very first projects that I worked on in OpenG was the Variant Library. And I really didn't have any idea about how LabVIEW packed its data and type descriptors, but I knew that I wanted to create a VI that I could pass anything into, and it could create an INI file or a JSON file. And I knew what it, kind of the interface should look like at a product level. And uh, I think I emailed on InfoLabView at the time, and there's a gentleman, John Pierre Drolet, who you know knew AppNote 154 inside and out, which is what documented all the data packing and type descriptor information. And I just learned an incredible amount in terms of how that worked under the hood, like what are variants, and, uh, and so it was just an incredible learning experience, plus it then enabled me to do what I needed to do, but having somebody else that could go deep in other areas. And with uh, VIPM, then OpenG Commander, uh, we lacked the ability to read and write zip formatted mm -hmm. files in a very kind of flexible cross-platform way. And uh, Rolf Kalbermotter uh, contributed uh, one of the, the core libraries wrapping the Zlib library in a DLL that Lab you could talk to and creating a nice set of VIs there. And so that was another example where I just learned an incredible amount and then was able to then get some tools that then enabled me to do uh, more. And so I, it really helped bridge a lot of gaps, both in terms of my learning and then also in just the capabilities of the LabVIEW community. But it really took that willingness for other people to kind of dive in and also share their expertise, right? Yeah, and so like just even today, like, you know, we wouldn't have VIPM without Rolf. <laughs> and maybe there'd be a different version of it in a parallel universe, but, and then like some of the stuff that I'll be, you know, showing later, uh, you know, converting VIs into JSON and things like that and working with AI, we wouldn't be able to do that without a really incredible variant library. Kind of all so, leads back yeah, to it. Yeah, it all, it all kind of goes back. So once in, yeah, like the idea, of, yeah, so Casey, please. Oh yeah, I was gonna say um, one example I was thinking of, again, with Bowser, uh, one, of the, one of the meetings that we're having where we're talking about features, I think it was, I wanna say it was Tom McQuillan, it may have been somebody else, if I'm messing this up, I, I apologize, that had the idea to, um, from the available messages, click on it and drag it onto the block diagram and put the send uh, method for that. And uh, that was inspired by QuickDrop, but then I incorporated that. And then at the GDEVCon two years ago where I was presenting, presenting on it, Enrique saw that, and he's like, that's really cool. I'd like to do something like that. And he incorporated that into his Panther dashboard for DQMH. And at the same time, he was doing something with the search for highlighting things that I hadn't known how to do. So then I, we, we got in a corner at some point, we're sharing the code and how we did it, and I was able to incorporate some of that features back into Bowser. So just not only like personal value, but just community tools, everyone sharing, and, and everyone's tools improving. It's really cool. Yeah, so a concrete example, I do a lot of web connectivity stuff, OAuth toolkits that are pure LabVIEW, don't use the .NET stuff. Um, 
did a really, really basic JSON implementation. Um, so here in the near future, I'm going to be using um, JDP's JSON text, swapping over to that. Um, so just other people that have had more time to do, you know, like Jim was saying, just the deeper dive on things, and now I can do the uh, higher level stuff because that's available. I don't have to invest that time myself. So. We have had customers actually pay for things that we had to put into the open source libraries because the feature needed to live there. And they were okay with saying, well, I don't care where you implement it, and I don't care that you share it afterwards because we need it. So that was actually like making real money from open source stuff. But that's the outlier. That's like the exception to the rule. And we've had uh, contributions where a feature was added that was perfect, so it fitted perfectly. But we've also had feature requests or, or issues, which I personally did not like very much, but couldn't really stop it because it made sense. And my team said, well, we, we're going to do that. So it's uh, opening up is, well, we can go both ways, I guess. I, I mean, in the name of you know, the value, have you also found, I mean, a lot of you are just clean coders by nature. Have you found that it, it forces you over that threshold to actually like, you take that extra step to make it more, you know, all the good things that you know that you should do when you put something out to the world? Or is that just, uh, I would have done that anyways, and so you, everybody else should just get on the board and write better code, more readable code? Uh, so I've got a bunch of packages that are several layers deep in dependencies, like a base layer communication, then I've got concrete implementations, and I've got HTTP utilities and a web server built on top of that, and then the OAuth uses all of that. Uh, so Developing things in, a package, in packages like that really forces you to implement the clean layers and the clean separations between them when an issue inevitably gets submitted and you now have to redo the whole package hierarchy. Um, you're going to do that about three times and uh, force yourself to clean things up properly. But I want to add to that that I think that sharing is more important than sharing a nice thing. So of course it's nice if you have like the proper package and a nice icon and the perfect readme file and the instructions how to install it, etc. But if it's a really useful thing and you, you're open to like having other people use it and you just put it online and you put a license that makes it clear and like some instructions, I think that's better than nothing. Can you so say I this is like sharing is better than sharing uh, nothing or sh sharing sh sharing something I think is better than sharing nothing even if that something is yeah. not perfect so you I think people so should not be afraid to yeah. share their code just because they are not experts or because oh. it's not so readable as the code that Darren would like to see my early packages are not very good <laughs> <laughs> but they were practice for later packages all right so this is of course gonna be a hot ticket item you know everybody's gonna have their their own gripe about it and that's fine what, are the, what would you say are the biggest pain points from doing open source stuff once again, in LabVIEW, not just LabVIEW development, but when trying to do the open source, once again, your own definition of what that was for you. Not necessarily doing open source, but just even making open source feasible. Um, how many presentations have happened already just in the past day and a half where you thought, oh, we're already doing that internal on our own team? Um, because LabVIEW is a paid environment, it's an investment for companies to use. A lot of the work we do is proprietary, um, and people want to hold on tight to that. Um, so it's it's just kind of an innate roadblock in the LabVIEW community. Um, so just more people that are more willing to... So it's like, hi, I'm the problem, it's me. Yeah. <laughs> more people that are just willing to, to share and, and help try and rise the tide, you know, raises all ships. So the things that come up for me that are hard, or that I see being hard to get over the hump, is uh, using Git in general is, is difficult. Even people that use it all the time sort of get stuck. I have three different like go-to tools that are good at different things, uh, maybe even four if you consider the command line. And then I think also two is ha being able to review things efficiently. So for example, if somebody submits, I, I <laughs> Uh, Nate Mooring submitted some great uh, improvements to some of the JSON parsing stuff. And the thing that's been holding me up is I can't see the changes in my browser when I go to GitHub and look at it. And so it's, it's difficult for me in good faith to be able to just merge the pull request based on what Nate says the code does. Uh, so a lot of us are taking screenshots, but we can't really see it uh, in a browser, and the diff merge process is pretty painful. Which LabVIEW version is it in? So there's just a lot of uh, pain points there. And then also, too, just in terms of validation. So even if I can see what the changes are and they look innocuous, 
Uh, I, I would love to have like a, an LED that's either green, all the tests are passing, or red, something broke. And all of those tests need to be running behind the scenes in the cloud on a lightweight container or something like that. And so uh, LabVIEW currently is pretty heavy in terms of the size of the install and the resources that it needs uh, to, to even run basic uh, stuff. Would, would, would the rest of you say, uh, you know, the idea of mm, kind of doing a single, but like t to merge without actually having open it and run it yourself is a big thing that you would like to be able to do, or you would naturally not do that anyway? Because I, I mean, I'm a control freak. I'm going to be like, I want to download that and check it and run it, uh, and just seeing a picture might not get me all the way there. But that's just me. I will say that an open source project probably needs a steward. So, especially in an open source scenario where there's not maybe a clear set of requirements, you can't really be sure that what people think should go into the, your library is what you want to see there for all sorts of reasons. So I think for open source, it's, it makes a lot of sense to have somebody review what's being uh, shared. And so what Jim, you were saying, I was going to say, there was, there's, like a, there's the cost to not only have the reviewer, but to whatever that reviewer is, be it an automated review process yeah. through, a, through a suite of tests, or just even somebody to get their system partitioned to, to match what the, the project requires, right? Yeah. And I, I'll also maybe make a plug. So I've been working pretty closely with Eli Carey. Uh, on the open source initiative, open sourcing more parts of LabVIEW. And so within the next kind of week time frame, we should be able to have a GitHub Actions runner that, that can run LabVIEW for Linux and run a suite of unit tests, um, you know, like in less than a minute, be able to run tests after the commit's pushed in order to validate that the code still works according to the unit tests. Interesting. And so that'll be, I think, pretty big for LabVIEW, and we're working on ways to get that uh, Docker image uh, available to other LabVIEW developers to be able to run their tests. And so I see that as being a huge catalyst for open source contribution, is being able to reduce the, the pain in terms of time and effort and cost to be able to validate that changes are to be accepted. So in the name of changes, like with open source, the idea is supposed to be, I was just talking with uh, Greg Richards Greg Jar yesterday, and the idea of um, the, like the concept of merging for us, of course, is not a graceful thing. And uh, Jorg, there was something that I think a conversation we had previously, you were saying, it doesn't hurt us because we've already beaten our people into submission so that the common list of things that you don't do, they don't do, lest they be flogged. Um, uh, right? Is that, is that true? I remember or? that conversation. Oh, okay. <laughs> so Darren Nattinger said earlier that like the most important thing is that the code functions, right? So as a steward or product manager of an open source project, like probably one of the most important things that I can do is to define the set of unit tests that say, yes, the code functions according to the definition of the product as I'm putting it out there, or no, it doesn't, right? And then for every submission, I need the green light, red sure. light on that. And so for, for being that steward or product manager of a big open source project, a lot of the work is setting up the infrastructure, right? And <laughs> The, you know, the analogy of, you know, monkeys on type, million monkeys on typewriters, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, you're getting a lot of different submissions of various quality levels. And so it's really important to be able to filter those out very, very quickly. And automated tests are really the only way to do that. Uh, so along those lines, in terms of either the ability to run the automated test or the ability to do merge, right? you're talking about some things to, to improve that. But still, kind of to the question is, what are some of those things like you would recommend people watch out for if trying to either publish something? Like if you're going to put something out there, Derek, right? you have your own internal credo of don't do this lest you be in pain. right? And I think as we're all trying to, like, hey, we all want to contribute or we want to uh, contribute to something existing or put our stuff out there, I think that idea of knowing these pain points ahead of time could probably help somebody because like, somebody might get into it and then they'd want to eject right away because they ran into these pain points. What might some of those be? Any other thoughts? Practice a lot. I don't know that I have like a, a good answer for that. I mean, you really have to try it. 
Um, I'm sure that if we put our heads together, we could probably have a LabVIEW wiki page that says here are the things to expect when you're submitting your first five packages. Uh, and then when you get to the 10th one, you have to go back and work on one of those first ones. Um, you know, there's stuff like the, the dependency management, making sure you have clean APIs between the different layers, um, establishing your, your, the purpose of something um, can get blurry over time. Um, and so having discipline around that. I don't have a lot of answers to this question, but it strikes me that the pain points for open source, they're different depending on your role in the project, right? Like Jim was saying, if you're a maintainer, um, the pain points of, of like setting up the, the automated testing, that's, that's a different pain point than someone who is new to the open source movement, right? And especially with LabVIEW, what do I need to do to get started? Maybe they're not familiar with, with Git. Uh, which version of LabVIEW am I using? And so I just think it's important to make that distinction um, when we're trying to solve pain points in, in general, that there are different things, different needs from different uh, users of the, or developers of the open source project. My experience is that it's the same as with every project or everything that you do. If you want it to be successful, you probably have to put in the work and you have to put in the hours. So if you want your open source project to be successful, you have to remove as many uh, barriers as you can. Like Jim said, if you can automate testing, you can already pre-filter things that are being shared. So you can spend less time on actually looking at, at the idea or the intent or whatever it is. And that also goes with documentation. The more you can document, the more you can describe what you want, or what you're looking for. Uh, the more advertising you make, the more you like try it out, the more you help people uh, when they contribute and it's not perfect that you take their hands, that you hold their hands. Uh, I personally don't mind like burning the midnight oil and, and doing that because I, I want to see those things like succeed. And again, as I said, it's kind of also an asset for my business. Uh, if I can get customers to use our open source tools, they're more likely to collaborate with us. Uh, but it's a lot of work. Uh, it's very much work uh, is what I'm seeing and if we don't put in the work it, it like it peters out awesome well thank you that's that's some great insights like i said i think a lot of us are intrigued i think Jim, one thing to mention as well for those of you who haven't quite caught on to this part of it right and i is trying to facilitate and put out there more things that were effectively closed source in LabVIEW. LabVIEW things very specifically, we're not open sourcing like the compiler and stuff like that, right? But the, the icon editor is one, like Jim was saying, how many people are like, you're, you're helping working with an I on that aspect of it, Jim, right? But it's, there, there's people from NI here as well that can talk more to the, the nuanced nature and how we're going, but there is absolutely a push to open up more of what you currently interface to in LabVIEW that is LabVIEW-based. So once again, for all the concepts that open source could bring. Yeah, and so for, for that, that really is an experiment. Um, I, I don't think necessarily the icon editor is where everybody would choose to focus their, their energy, but it's a relatively easy to understand project. The people who use it are LabVIEW developers. It's written in LabVIEW. And it honestly, like, it doesn't need that much love moving forward, although I'm sure there are things that could be improved. And so I think what we're, what we're learning in this experiment is um, how do we add a new contributor to the project? So somebody that wants to push code organizationally within NI and how you know, NI has its you know, product development processes, R&D processes, legal processes, licensing, like how do we you know, add a new person that's able to let's say, you know, create a pull request or review code um, and you know how can we efficiently automate the testing and the building and so we're, we're kind of like forcing ourselves to be guinea pigs and feel the pain and what is going to come out of this I think is that it's going to become easier for more people to contribute on other projects that they're personally passionate about. And so, you know, I, I personally would love to see an even better icon editor, but I think it's a lot of the other things that come out of it that we're really gonna see soon. Kind of the machine, getting the machine actually running, not only the edits and yeah, the merges, but and really. Honestly, one of, the, one of the things that I really wanted to do by encouraging NI to participate in some collaborative open source is to feel how painful some of these things are. <laughs> oh man, it's so hard to review this code. What version of LabVIEW did they check it in? How do we test it? What, you know? And so uh, to be able to actually kind of experience some of those pain points to then understand it, and, you know, and I, 
in addition to, well, has had a lot of sayings, Dr. T, I think, eating your own dog food, yep. right? Yep, we don't is, appreciate that, you know, sure. Unless you realize the dog food isn't that good, you're not going to want to make it a little bit better. And so I, I think it's a good opportunity for NI to eat its own Feel our own food. pain on that one. Yeah, no, no exactly. Doubt. And I think, too, just in general, in addition to understanding the pain points of open source contribution, I think the more folks within NI who are working on LabVIEW as a product who are also users of LabVIEW and experience just the day-to-day -day pains of LabVIEW, um, and experience the ideas of wanting new features, I think the better the product will get. Yeah, thank you. I and mean, Jim, you did a great job. Oh, uh, well, this kind of dovetailing into that one. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, like the, well, did you have something specific, Laura, you were thinking? Oh, just uh, reiterating that uh, LabVIEW versioning and um, for somebody just starting into open source projects, like somebody at a university, LabVIEW versioning and the installation process are very painful, which everybody here knows. Uh, so if those could be improved. But those are pain points when doing open source in LabVIEW. So one of the things, you know, in the name of the, the LabVIEW experiment, the aspect of it for the conversation, and actually I'm uh, glad you got the mic, Laura, because I wanted to hear your insights from the I'm using other people's packages, and you've done a lot of experiments and tinkering, as you had stated. When trying to do this, I'm going to pull a package that might not be in LabVIEW and try to integrate it into this beloved environment that we have in language. Uh, what were some things, and we can maybe just go down the row here in terms of what you've experienced that didn't really go as, as you had expected? Well, yeah, actually for this presentation, I was hoping to use Arduino and um, the LabVIEW links tools, and I found out that the Arduino that I had didn't work with links. So you know, at the last minute, I'm looking for another tool, and thankfully, CTI tools were there. Um, but things like that, when your hardware doesn't, isn't compatible with um, the LabVIEW packages that are open source, um, that's painful. Or uh, you've done this entire project, and you go to look for the package, and again, it's in a different version of LabVIEW. And it's like, do I change everything to the new version of LabVIEW, or do I change my hardware, or do I give up altogether? Um, yeah. So two years ago, I presented about the uh, LabVIEW web services replacement I made. Uh, I had pinged a bunch of people on LinkedIn and got some favorable feedback that people were looking for an alternative to web services. Um, the new NI web server doesn't handle sessions, and there's a couple of other quirks that were starting to drive people away from it. Uh, so I made a web server fully in LabVIEW, works on Linux, works on Windows. Uh, and pretty much nobody, like there's been like three people interested in it. Um, so it's, it's, you're gonna throw stuff out into the world and people aren't gonna see the value in it. They're not gonna wanna use it. Um, and just don't let that be discouraging. There's still cool stuff out there. Um, things I learned when I did that, uh, I apply, you know, just about daily at my job for architecture decisions or things like that. Um, so. Uh, it's not always going to go well. People aren't always going to see the value in the things that you think are interesting. Um, but that doesn't mean you should stop, and that doesn't mean you shouldn't contribute. Amen. <laughs> yeah, in, in a similar, similar vein, I think some of the ideas I had, which ways that some of the packages I put out were going to be used, getting feedback, maybe that's not how um, the, the users um, envisioned it being used, and it drove decisions to do maybe some things a different way. And sometimes I think as the, the originating developer of that stuff, you can be a little bit, bit discouraged by that. But like Derek is saying, try, try not to be. I mean, you want it, if you're putting it out there into the community and you want to improve the community, you want it to be successful, right? And so you need to take in other people's ideas. And oftentimes, it, I th think it leads to a better product, right? Especially, you can have all the great ideas you want, but if nobody's going to use it, then. <laughs> Uh, so I wanted to make a plug for the new LabVIEW 2024 feature, which is the save version. How many people don't know what I'm talking about right now? The save version feature. Okay, good. You guys have heard of it. So, uh, and it's gotten even better, I think, in the 2024 Q3. But basically, you can choose on a per project or per library level what save version. Per library would be new, just news to me. I knew it was per, per project. Does anybody know it per library? Too? Per library, I got to not. Yeah, and there. there's even a, a kind of semi undocumented feature that you can actually just plop a text file named dot lv version, no spaces, all lowercase, uh, in a folder. Shh, don't tell and LabVIEW will look in that folder and treat all the files uh, to be saved 
in that version. And so for open source development, or even within companies who are sharing libraries across several projects, being able to upgrade to the latest and greatest version of LabVIEW and use all the latest and greatest features while also having the code that you're working on being useful to people who haven't been able to take that leap yet is very, very powerful uh, because it increases your ability for these people to use it, you're free to make changes and improvements, and also it gives us the opportunity to play and explore with the new features in LabVIEW and then advocate for why those people should potentially upgrade if they'd like to in the future. And so it's a really fantastic feature. It's gonna be you know great for open source. I've been using it for a while now and I encourage everybody to give it a try. Awesome, plug received, but you still haven't answered the question. What was the question? <laughs> when has an open source experiment you tried not go as planned? Uh, probably all of them. <laughs> yeah, so Do tell. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I, th I think it, there's always gonna be something learned in an open source project, what, what people actually want and is useful is generally, you know, different. So, yeah. So uh, we've got, we've got a, 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 let's see, we've got one question. I think we've covered the next one, like what would you like to see NI do? And I think the, the answer from Jim and maybe other users would give me an amen on it is, you know, eat more of your own dog food and let's charge forward on the open source initiative that we have right now, right? Is there something else that, I know that Greg talked about, you know, workflows just in the, prior session before Darren's, I think, um, or earlier this morning, but what else uh, might you see that you, hasn't been heard in the past you know, eight hours? This is from NI, right? Um, just more championing of not just the icon editor, but other open source projects that are out there, right? Because it can be hard, and it can be difficult to find what is out there unless you come to something like GDevCon and you hear people talk about it and they provide the links. If, you, if you're not aware of that, it can be difficult. I know. I think as a part of the GID exchange, I, we were putting together, there are some, there are repos out there for other languages like awesome Python projects or, and, and we we're putting together something like that for LabVIEW. I don't know how far it's gotten. If somebody can, can tell me later. But um, being, bringing awareness to that sort of thing so that people can find these projects and contribute because if you can't find them, then you're not gonna get much contribution. How about using like external open source stuff once again in the name of like some of the open source things that maybe you worked on, Laura? What's going to make what would what should I do to make that integration of other projects that maybe you've seen out there possibly get better? Do you have any thoughts towards that idea of ingesting other external open source and you know us having to leave the LabVIEW code alongside of the other open source project, even though most people aren't going to understand what it is? Yeah, so obviously the Python node is huge, you know, keep improving that. And, uh, you know, from my time at JKI, Jim's working on some Rust integration, which is extremely exciting. So, things like that. Um, yeah, from NI, definitely, you know, more tools like the Python integration. Please. Coming back to the conversation you mentioned, Norm, mm -hmm. uh, not us bludgeoning anybody into submission, <laughs> but uh, for the people we work closely with, uh, it works out very well because we have a common understanding of how we can collaborate. So, we made we made do with the things we had, and we have our release automation tools and our pipelines and our workflows, so I think it works nice. So even with the current state of affairs, I think it's not fair to say that you can't do open source, you can't do continuous integration, you can't do those things. It's just troublesome and difficult, but you can do it. Anything and everything that an I will do to make it easier is, is a great thing for us, and the things that Jim is working on uh, will surely propel us forward. The one thing of out, out of all of the things that were mentioned is really seeing changes in the browser. I think being able to view code in the browser would like open up so many cool things we could do with that. So if I had one wish, if I had one wish, Greg, Eric, I don't know whoever, uh, that would be the one thing. So <laughs> I, I think what I would leave it at is just that. G, like the graphical programming language that we use, is a, is a language. 
you know, like Darren Nattinger was saying earlier, like you should be able to look at the code and see what it does, right? It should be readable. And, and we use that to, to express ideas with each other. We get into discussions about, you know, the colors of wires, but that is really kind of how we, you know, express ourselves and our ideas. And I really would like to see this language stay alive and also to be able to grow in, in new ways. There's just so much possibility for visual programming. A lot of the uh, AI tool, tooling, especially around kind of managing uh, large data flows, uh, is starting to use uh, visual, representation, visual yeah. representations of, uh, they call them DAGs, directed so acyclic graphs. Yep. Um, and I think that LabVIEW still remains the only like real true programming language. All these other things are just like a visual representation yeah. of the flow. And so uh, I think there's just a tremendous amount of opportunity. I think you know it really requires that NI and we start to think of it as a real programming language that you can do real computer science with. And you know there's some certain barriers to that right now that would be nice to see. Lower it a little bit, yeah. All right. So we have a small period of time, maybe enough for two questions. Um, anybody in the audience, you've seen the questions are coming up. What questions have popped to y'all's mind in the interim? And we'll have Jeff and Taylor run around. Is there any uh, thought on lowering the friction to the community edition of LabVIEW, like not having to do the sign up? Like, for instance, I get Python. I don't have to sign up for it. I can just go download it from my package manager. So. Is there any yeah, I mean, from, from the NI aspect of it, I don't know if that's going to be as much of a, a, a short circuit on that front of it. I'll let Eric maybe speak the more official words than, than me. But I would say that the community training initiative, who here doesn't know about the community training initiative, also referred to as CTI. All right, that's, okay, okay. So, and long story short, there is. We have an episode on it, if you guys would like to listen to it. There you go, we'll have you experiment, learn about that. Um, but it's uh, Derek and Steve Watts and others involved as well. But, a handful of others. Yep, it have created basically a, 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 a virtual machine, a Linux-based virtual machine that runs on like an open version of a VM thing. What's it called, open box, VM box? Well, it, virtual box, yeah, virtual box. So you can just download thing. an eight gigabyte file. Yep, it's big. But in any case, you open up virtual box, you open the thing, and you already have it open into there. Now, I think you can run it without having to like actually log in your name on that, that specific You have to community. activate. You do have to activate. Okay, so there's that aspect of it. I don't know if that's a limitation or if we'd ever want to not do that, but maybe Eric can speak a little bit more directly. I'll speak to that if you let me ask my question next. Oh, <laughs> And here's Eric. Fine. So um, for anybody who has that same question, I'm, I'm the one standing in your way. So you want to come and talk to me no matter what. Um, the, the, way, the reason we did that is for a variety of reasons. But at the end of the day, even though we're allowing everybody to use it in an, in an open environment, we still want to know who's using it. And that's the thing that you're, that's getting in your way. We want to make that as painless and invisible as possible. So. That piece, I'm, we're totally willing to talk about it. I think it's incredibly unlikely that we would have a version that just it's just out there and it can run and it doesn't require you to log in in any way. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is not have to tie it to a download. Um, I mean, even just this week, somebody the answer on the forum was trigger the download. You don't have to finish it, but then you can go back to your already installed Community Edition and it should activate. So having a separate so, mechanism, I think. So would I think help. from the activation standpoint, there's another. Uh, gentleman who's not here today, Ahmed, that we're working with, we are trying desperately to change the whole activation experience to be just a, it's a token. As long as you have an account on our website, it'll give you this token. The token will just activate stuff. So we want to fix that whole experience, not just related to the community edition, but like for everything. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of work going into trying to fix that experience. Um, and that feels like a very doable thing. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be perfect. Great. And uh, maybe time for one last question. I got a nod. So my, my question oh. was mostly oh. for these guys. Oh. They, they brought up the point of uh, being able to do diffing in the web browser. So I was talking to Greg and talking to the rest of the people here. If you're not, like, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. You can take the diff and make an HTML report and display the whole diff as an HTML document. So if you're talking about anything other than I want to be able to run the VI or actually have the editor running in the browser, I think we have a, a bunch of tools that already work to a degree. And I, I, 
Sure. Yeah, you sure. have you, ten, you, ten different tools that you have to write your own automation to get to work. I, get that I into. want to do a whole session on just like, here's the workflow, let's go through it. Because I think that it's important to start seeing, like you guys were talking about eat your own dog food. I think it's important for us to see where do the things break down? Because in my head, it's two tools. And I do it on a somewhat regular basis. And it feels like it feels more complicated to you. So I want to see where the disconnect is and actually work through that. I will go on record saying that seeing 200 screenshots of block diagrams that are different are not helpful for me in my experience. So I would much rather be able to do what I do in the IDE, click on something and see what it is. Yeah. Being able to run the differ or run some part of the environment, that's the hard part. So as long as that's where we're having the problem, I get it. If it's, I literally just want to see pictures of what I'm diffed before I allow this person to submit, 100% I can do that. I know, I just, uh, it didn't really work well for me personally. That's all I can say. Yeah. Okay. But it's worth, so uh, two different things that I've been told to talk about. Um, after tomorrow, we're going to be doing workshops, right? They got a not, yeah, there we go. It's going to be workshops after the conclusion of all presentations tomorrow. So I think taking, maybe the, the runners of this are taking notes on like, what is a potential workshop and maybe showing that workflow and actually running through that. What's that? Oh, sorry. Uh, so that might be an opportunity for that aspect of it and got a thumbs up over there. And also just keep in mind, if you're thinking about other workshops based on other presentations, be taking notes because I think they're going to be saying, hey, who wants to do a workshop on X, Y, or Z? And they're going to go critical mass on the ones that like, we're going to table over there, table over here, table up top, and somebody over at the bar will be there. Um, so th that's, that's one aspect of it. So for, uh, since we're, we're at time, I definitely want to thank our presenters here and all the people and thoughts that they've had on all this. And all the contributions. Exactly. Uh, and be sure, if you haven't checked out the LabVIEW experiment, it's on uh, all major platforms, Spotify, YouTube. Uh, and what's it? It says it on the next slide. It says it on the next slide. Fantastic. Isn't it great that our, there you go, uh, right there. Sponsor, yes, indeed, join that. And then, oh, that is it right there. <laughs> oh, favorite podcast platform. Sorry about that. I missed it right there. Yes. Good job, Marm. Indeed. So it has all those. And so please listen to it. They, they range in, in length and content. And some of them are just history stories or they're kind of saturated. And like if, you have, if you've just joined the community and you go, I don't know who everybody here is. When somebody says the name Jim, why does everybody know who that is? Well, that one, that's Jim right there for those of you who didn't know. Um, one of the many Jims, but you know, in terms of, sorry, Jim. <laughs> There's probably a lot of Jims up. Right? Of course. Fabiola, there you go. Fabiola, there you go. That's probably an easier one. There's fewer of those running around, indeed. Um, but in, indeed, so go ahead and do that, and let's make friends here, and thank you all for the contributions once again. That's it for today's episode of the LabVIEW Experiment. Thanks for listening. If you have any comments or questions, head over to thelabviewexperiment.com and drop me a note. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the LV Experiment.